All right, let's begin with, we ended last week with ARDS. So respiratory failure ARDS patients will be intubated and given oxygen, um, oxygen by uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, of course, the protocol is always to try non-invasive first. So most probably the patient if we've exhausted all the oxygen, non-invasive oxygen delivery systems, beginning from nasal cannula to a mask, then to a BiPAP, if we cannot meet oxygen goals for the patient, then the next step and the last resort is, of course, intubation. There are a few exceptions wherein we go straight to ventilation. I mean, intubation. Of course, if a patient goes into cardiac arrest, then uh, that would bypass all other um, non-invasive procedure. I mean, deliveries. Uh, also, in the case of uh, general anesthesia, as well as in severe burns, as you uh, learned in module one. In anyone on a ventilator your priority is really airway management. You can have the best working ventilator, but then if your airway is problematic, then it's no good. So you have to, there are certain responsibilities with airway management. Initial insertion means you have to verify tube placement. I'd like to uh, mention also that we do not personally intubate. You do, however, initiate it, meaning you're the one at the bedside, so you're the one calling respiratory therapy or calling rapid response for your patient to be intubated. Intubation procedure is done by a rapid sequence intubation now, RSI. It's non-traumatic, it's very peaceful, and it's very fast. They can get the tube in under um, one minute, uh, 90 seconds for most um, experienced uh, staff. Uh, what they do is sedate the patient first using usually rock uronium. It's a, um, a short acting uh, muscle paralyzer. Uh, it's necessary because even though a patient may be so weak and gasping for air, they will use what remaining ounce of strength they have to resist intubation. And as a result, they may cause injury to themselves because they will fight. <clears throat> um, because they're confused already, they have uh, less oxygen to the brain, so there's confusion, there's restlessness, and then here's someone putting in a stainless uh, laryngoscope down their throat. Of course, they will fight. So to avoid injury, uh, especially to the teeth, the tongue, um, we sedate the patient first. So we give them rock, and they're out within a few seconds, and then we put in the scope, and then the, and then the airway. Um, from then on, your responsibilities begin. So first part is to verify tube placement. Uh, the next one is to make, keep the airway patent because it's a plastic airway. Therefore, any foreign object inside you will always cause inflammation. And particularly in the airway, it will promote or stimulate production of mucus. So as long as the airway is there, mucus production will be increased. Therefore, you need to maintain patency by suctioning as needed. The oral cavity has also to be suctioned. Obviously, these patients can't swallow. There is a plastic airway um, in Pen, I mean, uh, impeding their ability to swallow. They cannot swallow, they cannot talk. They can only breathe in and out of that airway. 
So unlike you and I right now, we can breathe either through our nose or our mouth. We have a choice. These patients don't have that. They can only breathe through the endotracheal tube. ET tubes are also only used for maximum of about two weeks. So 10 to 14 days is the standard. If the patient requires longer mechanical ventilation beyond 14 days, the patient will be switched over to a tracheostomy. There are advantages to having a tracheostomy. The patient doesn't have to be sedated anymore. They can be uh, propped up out of bed. Um, they can sit in a the chair, they can eat, um, they can communicate uh, non-verbally, of course, but the, the sooner they're off sedation, the better outcome for the patient. Okay, again, if the patient's lungs cannot support their oxygenation needs uh, through spontaneous ventilation um, and will require mechanical ventilation longer than 14 days, the patient has to be switched over to a, a, a tracheostomy. All right, let's do the uh, procedure. So the usual size is about 7.5 to 9 millimeters long. That's the standard. We prefer oral intubation uh, over nasal uh, because of course it's uh, more convenient. Um, it's easier to maintain, less injury as well. Plus if you choose nasal intubation, that means the tube will be considerably smaller. So we want it bigger. Uh, so that's why we have the, we prefer the oral route. Um, it's only a backup. Okay, so let's say uh, we can't do oral intubation for whatever reason. Uh, let's say usual reasons are these. Um, too bloody and we can't see, uh, then we do nasal intubation. Questions on the test would be on, uh, one of the questions will be, who are intubated and put on a mechanical ventilation? I mentioned some earlier, and these are the rest of the indications. Even though it's all fast paced, uh, we still explain the procedure to the patient, whether or not they understand. We establish that we still explain the procedure to the patient. Again, regardless if they're already restless and uh, somebody tells the uh, patient, even just for formality. Okay. Uh, before all this, of course, somebody is bagging the patient until we can get the airway in. Who can intubate? could be a respiratory therapist, any physician, could be an anesthesiologist or a general practitioner, or it could be a nurse anesthetist or any advanced nurse practitioner. This is your typical airway. It has two lumens. We have wonderful types, which is, um, it has three, uh, which is better. So imagine this is your trachea right here. All right, so this is your trachea where the tube is. There is a uh, another type of tube that has three lumens. So this one only has two. This lumen here is your airway, obviously. That's where your breaths come in and out. And there's a second lumen here to inflate the balloon. So that's why you had the, uh, if you saw uh, earlier before I snipped this, there was a pilot balloon um, wherein if the cuff, this is the cuff, 
uh, is inflated, then this pilot balloon here will also be inflated. If it's deflated, then that means the cup is also deflated. They are con they are connected. Uh, you just attach a, a syringe filled with air, and and uh, I'll explain how the procedure work works. So the patient intubating inserts this and then attaches a syringe here filled with air and uh, so while somebody's bagging the patient so the 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 end of the et tube is attached to a bag valve mask while uh, someone attaches a syringe to the pilot balloon and then uh, so therefore this is the patient's neck right so someone will put a stethoscope here whoever's injecting air will apply the stethoscope here of course someone is bagging the patient constantly 12 to 20 times a minute and we will listen for airflow around the uh, uh, trachea so put the stethoscope here and we will uh, of course if somebody's bagging this patient we will hear a lot of air leak because at this point the cuff is still deflated it's still flat so of course every breath that comes in some of it will leak around here leak around here causing a lot of turbulence so it'll be very loud initially if the cuff is still deflated and then the person will slowly inflate the cuff until we hear um no more air leak so as soon as the air leak is gone we stop inflating so therefore we have achieved minimal occluding volume the reason is we don't want to over inflate the cuff that will put pressure on the vessels of the trachea because the trachea is smooth muscle it has blood vessels so if you compress it by over inflating the cuff because you want to make sure i want to make sure that it's really sealed well if you over inflate it then you are pressing on these vessels causing ischemia and then necrosis and actually it will cause dilation of the trachea as well so we only want minimal occluding volume uh, the procedure is called minimal leak technique um, minimal mlt it's like your sandwich uh, minimal leak technique meaning we want only the minimum uh, um, seal in order to prevent any air leaks because what we want is all breathing the air must go into the lung and not leak out here we otherwise um our our breath delivery is ineffective we already measured how much uh, tidal volume vt is tidal volume that is this is the amount of air delivered by the ventilator with each breath it's already calculated based on weight other facilities use the height which i um, i actually am more for the height because i think the i believe the patient's lung the size of a patient's lung is commensurate with the patient's height correct because if you have a weight it doesn't mean that a four foot eight patient will have a who, who weighs 500 pounds has a bigger lung compared with a six foot five per, uh, person with who weighs only uh, maybe 200 pounds do you agree yeah yeah yes, so anyway so most hospitals though use weight as a basis for tidal volume so we already calculated that so we want that air which is calculated for both lungs to go inside those two lungs not leak around and then go back out because otherwise we will only be delivering half the tidal volume or maybe a third 
All right, so we need to seal this area. As a result though, because the patient can't swallow and there will be continuous secretions, uh, there may be secretions inside, which is what we're able to suction. However, this area here and here called the subglottal area, subglottal because it's below the glottis, the epiglottis is somewhere here. So this is the subglottal area. We cannot reach this with a oral yanker. This has to be suctioned with a suction catheter. We have to shove the catheter inside the patient's throat in order to clear this area because there will be saliva, mucus here, and we cannot get to it. So the tube that I was uh, mentioning earlier, which is convenient, has holes here meaning it has a third lumen. So besides the airway lumen, the balloon, the cuff lumen, there is a suction lumen, meaning there are holes here for a third lumen, which would be in the opposite side of the pilot balloon. This one you attach to a suction uh, extension, and then it allows you to suction this area here. Okay, no need to drop a catheter to suction it, so making it very convenient. I don't know why not all hospitals use that because that is the um, no the best thing to use. Plus, it allows you to really clear the subglottal area. Any question on the um, uh, cuff inflation? We'll discuss the cuff inflation pressure next. All right, next job is to verify tube placement. Just because we have inflated the cuff, that means that we are in the trachea. It could be possible that the tube is in the esophagus, because whether it's in the esophagus or the ex or, or the trachea, we will still hear the air leak as we are bagging the patient. Now, the next step after it is inserted and the cuff inflated before we secure it in the patient's mouth is to verify placement first. So there are a few ways to confirm placement, that, but there are two accurate ways to do it. There has to be two because one is not enough. The first one is to detect for the presence of CO2. We call it the end tidal CO2. So this is a measured by a capnometer. You've probably seen a capnometer in clinical because you guys were in clinical for at least uh, hospital clinical for at least one and a half semesters. Uh, if you've come across it, there are big machines. They're the size of a blood pressure machine. So you, you probably can't tell them apart because they have they, they look exactly the same. The the difference is on the screen, uh, of course, it won't be able to get a blood pressure, but however, there's a sensor attached to it, which you put at the tip of the ET tube. So at the end here, this one, on the connector, so you put the sensor here and it will register whether or not there is carbon dioxide coming out of the tube. Of course, if there is um, normal or even high CO2 levels, where is the tube? Hello? In the trachea. All right. Because if there's negative CO2 or very low, then that means it can't be in the trachea, it must be in the esophagus. So that's the first one. Uh, again, that's not enough because we need to know where is the tip. 
this tip right here must rest two centimeters above the carina. The carina is the is this is the area where the main stem bronchus branches to become the right and left main stem bronchi. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because the yes, trachea yes, yeah. branches off, right? Okay, so we have the right main stem bronchus and then we have the left main stem bronchus. So that area where they bifurcate, where it forks, is called the carina. To give you a visual uh, or an analogy, carina would be like your crotch. Okay, so between your right and left leg, so your crotch would be the carina. Does that help? Yep. yep. All right. So you want the tip of the ET tube, this one, to rest two centimeters above the carina. So that would be the perfect location. That way, when air is delivered by the vent, it will go to both lungs instead of one. So we need to verify where is the tip. That can only be verified by X-ray because these are these are radio pep radio pack material here they will appear on x-ray until then though we continue of course this whole time someone is bagging the patient we have not connected the patient to the ventilator yet so those are the first two which are most reliable others are assessing for symmetrical chest rise that means air is delivered to both lungs unless of course one lung is uh, let's say collapsed okay that would be the exception but uh, these are the other ways you assess for placement however the only way you can confirm is both the x-ray and the e and tidal co2 detection the most common displaced tube is right main stem intubation this one right here um, naturally it will always go to the right bronchus because of its anatomy it's straighter and uh, of course when you insert the tube too far in then that means it will go straight to the right bronchus it will never go to the left because the left has a um, more acute angle um, so a, so a, pla a rigid plastic tube cannot cannot bend easily into the uh, left bronchus. So it will always go to the right. Uh, if that happens, which you can see by x-ray, as well as the um, rise, chest rise only on the right side, none on the left, um, the, the radiologist reading the x-ray will, will tell you in the report, you know, the, the, the tip of the ET tube is not in the carina. It's so many centimeters into the uh, right bronchus. So the, the report will come with a recommendation that, you know, pull the ET tube so many centimeters and then it will, um, and then before we tape it. Um, taping it, part of the documentation will be, there are numbers here on the ET tube right here. So for instance, uh, these are in centimeters. So 18, 20, 22, 24. So we will mark where, what number did the tube exit out of the teeth. If the patient doesn't have teeth, let's say, you know, they wear dentures, then it'll be the lip, all right? Of course, everybody will know, you know, oh, there's no teeth then uh, of course, the, the lips will be the basis for the marker. So we document these markers. Therefore, if let's say the next day, um, when today we marked it at 22, if the next day the marking is now at 24, what happened to the tube? On the day, again, on the day of intubation, we marked it, documented that it was at 22. The next day, you came in, you found it at 24. 
is it in the right place? No. no. What no, happened no. to the tube? Was it pushed in or it was, was it pushed pulled out? <clears throat> pushed in. Okay, so obviously it was pushed in. So therefore, what will you do? Is your tube still in place? No. no. Where could it be? Uh, deeper in the lungs. All right, it's then in the right bronchus. So you need to pull it back up to the 22 level. What if you find it at level 20 centimeter, at the 20 centimeter mark? Flowing deep in. Uh, 20, 20 centimeter mark. Oh, it's coming up. Coming out. Oh, it was pulled out. All right. So uh, now you know, you understand how to um, assess. OK. Next is the um, endotracheal cuff, cuff intubation, I mean uh, inflation. So we in, inflated it earlier. So right after inflation, wherein we didn't have the leak anymore, we will attach a manometer. A manometer is the size of a, um, you know, the, the bulb that you inflate a blood pressure cuff with? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have, uh, imagine a device, um, two of those. So it, um, let's see if there's a picture. Uh, no picture. Um, anyway, it's a handheld. It's like a, a scanner. You see the scanner you use at uh, the size. It's just the size of a scanner, a handheld scanner at the grocery when you do self-checkout. When you have barcodes that don't, that don't um, that don't scan on the on the counter right. where you have to pull a handheld scanner and then scan the barcode yeah. so it's, yeah. it's that size the only difference is of course the instead of a laser coming out there's a gauge on the on the upper part so it's like a tire pressure indicator so when you press the trigger, it will tell you how much pressure is in the cuff. So you attach that manometer to the pilot balloon right here where you, you um, attach the syringe. So you attach the manometer here and then press the trigger. And then when you do that, when you do that, it will measure how much pressure is in the cuff. Because the pilot balloon only tells you that if this is inflated, it tells you that the cuff is inflated. It cannot tell you how much air or how much pressure is in the cuff. You need to measure that air using a manometer. The cuff should only be inflated between 20 and 25 millimeters of mercury. Anything higher than that is dangerous it's already going to compress the trachea, uh, the tracheal vessels and cause ischemia and necrosis. So everybody's neck is different size. Mine is different from yours. So we don't know how much pressure each patient's neck, I mean, um, a trachea will require. Uh, however, based on evidence, it's the safe range is only between 20 and 25. Anything bigger than that is probably an elephant or any other larger animal. But human beings only have a, uh, a tracheal size between 20 and 20 uh, um, uh, to fit um, or to require 20 and 25 millimeters of mercury. All right. So as long as it's within that range, then the patient is safe. It's again and um, important because not only to prevent tracheal necrosis but also to uh, maintain proper oxygenations here high cuff pressure we know will cause necrosis low cuff pressures will result in not only ineffective oxygenations but secretions will go down remember the part where we have the uh, subglottal area so therefore, if you don't have a proper seal, secretions will go down around the cuff and then into your patient's airway. 
Now, those secretions, although those are your own, those are, uh, we don't know what's in those. We know that they're old. We know that we're supposed to spit secretions, not swallow them. Um, plus, in this case, it secretions are supposed to go out of the lungs, not into it. So there are bacteria there now, which normally aren't inside the lung. Now you're introducing them there. This will therefore promote pneumonia. And this is one of the most common causes of ventilator associated pneumonia. So we've already uh, ensured proper cuff inflation. We have um, verified placement of the tube using the different techniques here, x-ray and tidal CO2, chest rise, lung sounds. Okay, so we've confirmed placement. We've uh, properly inflated the cuff. Now we can secure the tube. So we have commercially available tube holders. We used to use tape. However, these patients do drool, they perspire. So what will happen to the tape if the face gets wet? Come off. Yeah, they'll come off. So it's better to use commercial um, tube holders because they have Velcro. So they fit uh, around the tube and around the patient's back of the head and neck, and they um, sec they are secured with Velcro. It's very easy to to use. You just slide it over the the tube holder, and then um, if you've ever you know uh, use. Uh, shoes or any any other device that has a velcro strap it you, you can figure it out okay a uh, caveman can do it some patients may need bite blocks um, so if the hospital uses bite blocks then you can put a bite block there but as long as you keep the patient sedated your oxygen delivery okay they don't um, experience hypoxia um, they, there should be no reason why they would bite the tube. And they have pain medication uh, infusing, that yeah, they should be fine. Uh, anyway, if the patient do, do uh, if the patients do bite the tube, it will trigger the high pressure alarm anyway. So you'll know if they're getting restless and biting the tube because it will trigger a um, high pressure alarm because the patient's biting it. So therefore, the airway is obstructed. Um, so, so you will know. Uh, I already mentioned sedation. It's necessary. This is very uncomfortable. Imagine having. Uh, it's it's okay to you know suck on a straw or uh, some of you have the habit of keeping a toothpick in your mouth. There are people like that. Just you know orally fixated. They want something in the mouth. That's fine. But if it's in your throat that is extremely uncomfortable uh, and may cause pain as well. So therefore sedation and uh, pain medication is necessary. All right, I mentioned some of these already. So we did, um, as far as maintaining a patent airway that is done through suctioning. Okay, uh, again, suctioning is the only way you can keep it patent. Um, both the um, the tube as well as the subglottal area have to be suctioned. The oral cavity should also be suctioned. Um, airway suctioning is as needed. Oral suctioning is done routinely every two hours. We did maintaining correct tube placement. And monitoring oxygen will be accomplished through vital signs as well as ABG. ABGs will be drawn by the nurse because the patients have an arterial line. The doctor will insert a arterial line for that purpose because they right, realize that the if they want ABGs, it'll take a long time to call respiratory therapists because there you may have a dedicated <coughs> respiratory therapist in your unit. <clears throat> However, most of the time you don't. Uh, th that respiratory therapist may be shared between two units or even if they're in the same unit, uh, the respiratory therapist can't be in 
one patient's room or multiple rooms at the same time. So uh, to enable the nurse to uh, get ABGs themselves, then the doctor will insert an arterial line. So therefore you have, you can draw arterial blood. You collaborate with the respiratory therapist. Now it is your job, okay? It says clearly here, these are your jobs. Maintaining patent airway, that means you are suctioning the patient. Proper cuff inflation, these are the, the role of the nurse, not the respiratory therapist. You can share the role with the respiratory therapist, but it says clearly here, this is your job. If the patient is off sedation, communication is uh, of course facilitated with <clears throat> um, when the patient's off sedation so we can use communication boards uh, including a Ouija board okay that'll, that'll work it has letters in it um, <laughs> however you uh, what they're trying to say here is you you continue to communicate with the patient even if they're sedated if it, even if they cannot uh, communicate back all right, I find myself guilty of this. Uh, I forget that, you know, there's a patient here uh, and I, you know, I have casual conversations with um, whenever we're turning the patient, you know, cleaning doo-doo and uh, doing skin care. Um, I, you know, I find myself oh, just talking as if the patient doesn't exist, All right? And, and it's, you know, it's very uh, disrespectful. Uh, the patients do hear it. And some of them do remember what is said. Uh, somebody got in trouble one time uh, commenting about the patient's bush while we were cleaning. The, the guy, um, you know, said, oh, that's a lot of bush. And the patient remembered when she was extubated. And boy, was it, was it you know, uh, it was embarrassing. It was, I mean, the, the gossip went all over the hospital. Anyway, Ooh. so just... Um, you know, don't forget, um, it may happen to you, um, but, you know, just be aware that the patients can hear, right? So uh, treat them with respect, you know, don't assume they can't hear just because they are sedated. Suctioning is easy because we use inline systems, so you don't need to um, remove the the ventilator. Uh, I mean, you don't have to remove the circuit. You know, sub, um, disconnect the patient from the vent. You don't need to uh, remove the disconnect the circuit. When I say circuit, I'm referring to those blue flexible hoses attached to the vent. You know what I'm referring to, right? Yeah. Okay. So the inline suction catheter is attached to the end of the end of the ET tube. Uh, so you just simply uh, turn off the vent alarm because it will trigger it when you're suctioning because it will cause obstruction and trigger the high pressure alarm. So you just simply insert the catheter, uh, apply suction, and then um, uh, take it back out. Okay, as simple as that. Um, yeah, no need to, you know, put on sterile gloves because it's in a sheath. It, it's a inline catheter, so it stays sterile. We do change it every 24 hours. Uh, just don't forget to do that. It's usually the uh, night shift's job. So at the end of the shift, the night shift is supposed to uh, discard the uh, previous catheter, put in a new one. So the morning shift nurse assumes that it's already a new catheter, all right? Suctioning, of course, you know the effects already. We learned this in dysrhythmias last semester. This can cause severe bradycardia or even SVT, uh, especially if you do it too, too long, too frequently. <clears throat> um, and of course, you know every time you suction, you're causing hypoxemia because you're occluding the airway and you're literally suctioning not only secretions but oxygen out of the patient's lung. So always as needed only. Um, you do assess uh, routinely. So assessing for the need for suction 
is routinely done. Suctioning itself is done only as needed. All right, we have a list for the need of suctioning. We'll go to that later, it's table 7.4, and uh, more also in 7.5. Uh, I don't want to go there yet because I'll, I'll lose this page. All right, we're still on airway, okay? We haven't done mechanical ventilation yet. Uh, complications. Patients get off sedation, for instance, or your sedative, uh, infusion bag is empty because you were busy, you forgot to hang, so it's been beeping for the last three hours. Now the patient's awake. So they came, they come to and find all these tubes. They are um, confused what's going on. The first thing they'll do is, of course, pull that tube out. So unplanned extubation uh, is very, uh, is the most frequent cause of unplanned estimation the patient uh, is off sedation because um, we don't restrain the patient okay that's not I mean have you ever seen patients restrained in hospitals nowadays when was the last time you've seen patients restrained probably never they don't, yeah they don't do that anymore yeah so in my time, we did a lot. We did soft restraints, uh, but now it's now on a necessary, you know, uh, if you have an order basis. Um, plus, it's a hassle to have one because you have to assess the patient more frequently. They have, a, they're pretty much making it hard for you to put your patients on a on a restraint. There's so much paperwork to do, so many um, assessments to do and very frequent once you put the patient on a restraint. So it's not worth it. So as long as you just maintain sedation, maintain your analgesics uh, infusion, these, as you maintain that, you do your job, you don't need to sedate, I mean, to restrain your patient. Uh, here's what you do. If it occurs, uh, just yell for help. Do not leave the patient. Bag the patient if necessary. Uh, until the doctor comes back in. Uh, if the patient is breathing fine, they, they uh, you know, sometimes they'll say, oh, there's no, you know, there's no point reintubating the patient. The patient, you know, is breathing okay. Uh, but if otherwise, then of course, the uh, patient will be sedated again. I mean, intubated again. Aspiration is another problem that always leads to pneumonia. So instead of ventilator-associated pneumonia, now you have aspiration pneumonia, which, as you've already uh, known last week, is a form of direct lung injury, and so therefore will cause either respiratory failure or ARDS. The head of the bed elevation is 30 because 45 degrees remember these patients are sedated so they cannot turn independently they cannot switch and scoot their butt they can't make adjustments so therefore 45 will promote uh, pressure ulcer or shear injury so 30 is best uh, although we do the turning but you know how we get busy we forget uh, but as long as we do the every hour i mean every two hour oral care we should turn the patient also every two hours. Oh, uh, one more thing, we should also change the position of the tube. So if the tube is right here in the in the center of the mouth. So after you do mouth care, because you're moving it anyway to, um, to put your yanker in to do oral care, uh, don't forget to switch it to, uh, to the side. Okay, so change position. So if you're turning the patient left and right, you're also turning the tube left and right or to the center because it is a hard plastic airway it will cause pressure injury on the mucous membrane all right we know this uh, we, we, this is repetitive a 
Okay, here, uh, this is the tube that I mentioned earlier, which is the best. It has a subglottal suction adapter. Um, so that will be most convenient. So 14 days later, patient still needs mechanical ventilation. We are unable to wean for whatever reason. Patient now gets a tracheostomy. Here are the advantages. There are also disadvantages, of course, uh, right here. So disadvantages because you diverted the airway out to the neck um, with using a uh, tracheostomy tube. Uh, of course, the patient cannot verbally uh, communicate, but we always have hand gesture and hand gestures. We have the Ouija board. Right, so there's other forms of communication, but you can see how many advantages there are versus one disadvantage. All right, it's not an it's not as if the patient can talk with an endotracheal tube; they still can. Uh, just please read the the intubation process. I won't really. Let me see if I have questions here uh, not really because we're not the one doing the intubation that's why i don't have questions on that um, and these we already mentioned we already talked about this in the paragraph so yeah here though is this is your job so management of the airway you already know uh, maintaining uh, verifying tube placement every shift um, oral care every two suction as needed uh, turning and all that um, proper cup inflation um, yeah so suctioning is how you maintain the airway all right And we have these. Oh, uh, I forgot about DBT prophylaxis. Anyway, that will be ordered. You'll have either low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. Any questions so far? No. All right. Uh, Brett Sounds, please um, read this on your own. This is a review. Uh, Okay, suctioning. Please review suctioning. We haven't been in the lab, so you could uh, easily forget because you haven't been doing this since March. Uh, please review. As far as... Although it's not mentioned here about whether it's intermittent or continuous suction, um, the latest skills books in the latest editions of the textbook now say continuous suction, not intermittent. Again, I'd just like to clarify because we know that in the edition of the textbook you use for fundamentals, it still said intermittent, correct? And yeah. The, yeah. And in fact, the most B skills still said it was uh, intermittent. Now the latest textbooks now say continuous suction, but only apply this to a artificial airway. Is that understood? So artificial airway, continuous suction. I cannot say the same for oral or nasotracheal suctioning without an airway. I believe that one is still intermittent, but artificial airway suctioning now say continuous suction but still in both instances we still apply suction only during catheter removal only when you're um, withdrawing the catheter always in a rotating uh, motion mm -hmm. and still no longer than 10 seconds uh, before and after should be uh, hyper oxygenated just don't forget to turn your oxygen back down after you are done suction. 
all right so these are your rationales um, this one isn't really uh, necessary anymore for inline because how do you uh, rinse the catheter for an inline so we don't Uh, we do suction the patient's mouth and do oral care every two hours or as often as necessary. Okay, knock yourself out. There's really no limit there for mouth care. Mouth care is done every two because the patient cannot close their mouth. They have it open all the time because the tube is there keeping it open. Therefore, it's exposed to air. It's dry. Um, I mean, it, it, it you know it, it dries up because it's open. Uh, so therefore you need to perform mouth care frequently okay it has to be every two hours the nurse manager can know whether or not the unit is providing mouth care because she he or she counts the number of q care tips on the unit because the q care tips these are the do you know what i'm talking about those um toothettes and brushes that uh, come in packs they usually colored bright green then you know what i'm referring to no uh, keep, keep. no tips uh, how about now you see this You see this? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. You see yes. this one, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are uh, Q-Care um, kits. So the, the manager orders these from Central. Mm -hmm. So she knows how many she ordered and she counts how many vent days she has on the unit. So vent days is calculated by how many patients are on the vents times how many days. So that's your ventilator days per week. So based on that, she already knows you're supposed to use one every two hours. So if there's, if the supply doesn't uh, correspond with the demand, meaning are the nurses doing them? Mm -mm. No. No. Some nurses are bad. They throw these things in the trash. That way, you know, um, which is, I mean, that's not, you know, we don't do that, but um, I've seen them. Yeah. Uh, you know, right, that tracheostomy tubes can be permanent or temporary. So if it's permanent, of course, the doctor will perform, uh, will have to remove um, some cricoid uh, cartilage. Uh, most of these, though, are uh, temporary. So just one vertical incision and we put the tube in. So here, beneficial because the patient here can eat now with the tracheostomy. They can safely eat. Uh, they can't do that with the AT tube. Um, you know what an obturator is, right? But that's it. All right. If not, this is... Um, when the doctor inserts a tracheostomy tube, because the end of the tracheostomy tube, imagine you have a, here, on the neck, you have um, one single vertical incision. So this one is only showing the trachea, but over this, you have this, you have the epidermis, you have the hypodermis, subcutaneous layer, mus a fascia, muscle, and um, uh, and then the trachea. So there are several layers there. So um, when you insert this thing here, the end of it, the tip isn't rounded, so it won't go in easy through this small incision. So putting something with a sharp edge and uh, uh, round shape through a vertical incision which doesn't look like this, it'll just be a slit. Okay, on the skin, you only see a slit. 
So therefore, this won't go in. You need an obturator, which is rounded tip, to go in there, and then you can insert the airway. However, I mean, however, this is a solid plastic. So while it's in there, it inside here, it fits inside, fits inside here, fits inside here. Of course, the airway is obstructed because this is a solid plastic. So you only need an obturator in order to insert the airway. After inserting, don't forget to remove the obturator because the patient cannot breathe with that in there. So this is only used for insertion purposes. Now, you should have one at the bedside. If a patient, any patient who has a trach, you should have a replacement airway with an obturator. Clear? Because if, God forbid, this thing pops out, patient has no airway because the track will close. You, you understand? This is not a permanent tracheostomy. There is no surgery to uh, mm -hmm. remove cartilage rings or to stitch the outer skin uh, so that it remains open. No, this is just one incision. The only thing that will keep that incision open is the airway. Airway pops out, no more, uh, no more hole, okay? Because the, 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 the layers, like I mentioned, the skin, the, the epidermis, the dermis, the subcutaneous layer, the fascia, the muscle, they're not always aligned. They slide against each other, so it can close that hole. Can you picture that? Yes. Okay. So therefore, if this um, accidentally pops out, so at least you need, you have this. So you put this in here and then uh, put it in there. That way the patient can breathe. Okay. The, the, the spare tube is always one size smaller than the original one. Um, just to make sure it, it goes in. Because if it's the same size, we may have difficulty putting it in because over time, the, the, the tissues start to grow back and the uh, opening will now be uh, not as big as the initial one uh, made when the doctor made the incision. Yeah, we did that. Okay, tracheostomy care. The part here where I usually see students making a mistake is on the the ties. Um, where are the ties? Okay. This part here says it requires two caregivers to do it. But what if you're the only one? You can't find a second person to help you hold the, the, the tube holder while you change the tracheostomy tie. So if you're only one, then that means you have to tie, put on the new Velcro straps first. That means the patient will have two sets of uh, Velcro straps, you know, tube holders. Um, if because if the patient coughs while there's only, there's no tube holder securing it, of course that will pop out the, the, um, the tube if the patient coughs, which they can cough anytime. So therefore, if there's two persons, then the, the, um, the second person will be holding the, the plate, the um, tracheostomy tube holder, the, the face plate in place, holding it down while you secure, remove and secure the new tubes. If you're alone, then of course you have to put on and secure the new straps before you take out the old. And there should only be one to two fingers. So one finger is correct, two fingers is correct. So that's how tight it should be. You should be able to put in one finger or two fingers. Uh, suctioning, here are the indications, Seven. where is 7.5, 7.5, this is 7.5, right? Yeah, 
So the indications for suctioning, I forgot. Oh, right here. So these are the indications for suctioning. All right. It's above the table. And you already know how to suction. Please read the procedure on your own. Uh, here's a safety alert. Because you're supposed to keep monitoring the patients. Uh, oxygen saturation. I mean, most of these patients are on a cardiac monitor, so you'll know changes during suctioning. Okay. All right, we'll do. Okay, so this since the pneumothorax is here, let's do a pneumothorax. Or maybe not. No, no, no. This will be in chapter 27. Okay, let's go back to chapter 27. Any questions on airway management? Okay. Now let's go to All right, uh, this is the page where I um, didn't include it on the module. This is the one I forgot. So please add this, page 95. This is now under mechanical ventilation. So we've intubated the patient, managed the airway, and now we uh, put the patient on a ventilator. So these are the indications again. So besides ARDS or respiratory failure, these are the other indications for mechanical ventilation. So anytime the patient is unable to meet their own oxygenation needs by uh, spontaneous ventilation, then they have to be um, intubated and put on a ventilator. Now, take note that the mechanical ventilator 
will not cure the underlying condition. It was uh, right here, it says here specifically, it's not a cure. It's only going to keep your patient alive until you cure the underlying condition. For instance, these are the underlying conditions, correct? So once you treat the underlying condition, then the patient can be taken off mechanical ventilation. But until then, they need to stay there because they cannot meet their oxygenation needs via spontaneous breaths. So they need help. Um, you can add COVID-19 to the to the list, okay? Although COVID-19 can really lead to respiratory failure, so technically it's already included there. Um, but you know, it's the main issue uh, at during these times. So here, once underlying condition is corrected, then they can be extubated. All right, we won't test the types of ventilators because there are several types. We have time cycled, pressure cycled uh, ventilators. But regardless of the type, they do the same thing. They will, um, however, we will test the modes of, the uh, of a mechanical ventilation. So this is the typical setup. So we have two circuits uh, attached to the patient. This is the uh, tube holder I talked to you about. Uh, looks like this patient has a bite block. Uh, and this is the uh, tip of your ET tube attached to the circuit. Now, uh, as you can see, the, the length of the tube is standard. You cannot cut this. They, they, it's one piece. We do not routinely change this thing. Uh, we change it. Usually one is used for the whole therapy. Uh, unless, of course, the patient's been here two weeks, then you know it's too old, we change it. Or if it's if it's full of um, stains from the condensation, uh, then we change it. But um, it's not routinely changed. However, there is humidification. As you can see here, we have the humidifier. So there will be condensation here on the dependent loop here. There will be some water um, accumulating there because of the moisture from the humidifier. Plus, the air is warmed by the ventilator before it goes into the patient. <clears throat> That's important so that it, this cold air will trigger coughing. <clears throat> so it's warmed, plus you have moisture. So, you know, just like that's how storms form, right? So you have moisture and um, uh, warmth. So therefore, it will promote condensation. So if there's condensation here, please do not return it here. Do not pull. Um, pick up the tube and then return the water in there because that's already dirty, it's already outside. And you know you can't put it into the patient, so simply remove the patient, just takes a few seconds, just disconnect the circuit from the patient, then drain that water out, all right? Because uh, uh, the amount of water there, if it rises, then of course it will obstruct the tube, then you'll have a uh, high pressure alarm. All mechanical ventilations are negative, I uh, know, are positive pressure ventilators. We are negative pressure ventilators. How we breathe is we have negative, negative pressure inside, there's positive pressure in the atmosphere. So in order to breathe, our diaphragm contracts, air is sucked into the lungs. And then when the diaphragm relaxes or rises back up, it will push the air back out and um, air is exhaled. So it's completely passive uh, and we are, by design, we are negative pressure ventilators. There were negative pressure ventilators in the past, you know, in the, during the World War, um, no, ages ago. They're not practical. Um, because the negative pressure ventilators are the size of a cylinder. Uh, imagine a big uh, water heater. Okay, the water heaters you have in your boiler in the basement. So th the tank is like that. So we put the patient's body inside with only the neck and the head sticking out. So that was what a negative pressure ventilator looked like by design because we, we, we mimicked... Um, 
the the patient's own lungs, you know, how we breathe. And that means we have to create a vacuum in order to suck the, the air in. And then that means if we need to clean doo-doo, we need to uh, listen to lung sounds and everything, we have to take the patient out of that cylinder and do our thing. So it will interrupt the treatment uh, and the ventilation. So you will have to bag the patient while we do that. So very impractical, not a good idea. So now we have positive pressure ventilation. So you can forget this because these are non-existent. You see them in museums uh, or in maybe some patients' homes because some of them bought negative pressure ventilators during the polio epidemic. Um, polio of the lung, okay, not polio of the leg. Uh, so yeah, so, so some people had uh, polio of the lung and were put on these um, negative pressure chambers. <clears throat> so now all our ventilators are positive. So they push air in. Okay? So exert positive pressure, putting it into the lungs. Okay, so that's how we, we accomplish it. So it's better, it's more effective. However, there are, of course, uh, several complications. Um, how it works. Uh, of course, is uh, air is delivered by a passive pressure. Um, so the vent delivers air and then simply stops delivering it, stops pushing it, allowing the patient to exhale. So exhale remains passive. Exhalation remains passive. So no need to suck the air out during uh, exhalation. All right. Um, how much tidal volume, of course, depends on lung compliance and resistance. What is compliance? Compliance is the, availab uh, the ability of the lung to expand and recoil. Um, so the stiffer the lung, the less compliant it is and the harder it is to ventilate. Think of it this way. Um, Okay, all right. Just trying to recall the formula. Okay, compliance. Compliance equals change in pressure over change in volume. What does this mean? So I said the compliance is the ability of the lung to expand and recoil. Now, the compliance is affected by uh, several conditions. So in a normal lung, which is air filled, no fluid in there, no pneumonia. So it's usually soft. It's uh, very compliant, very pliable. So you can put in air in there, uh, millions of alveoli uh, inflate and then um, and recoil, thereby uh, pushing CO2 out. Okay. So if you therefore, if compliance changes, so let's say the higher the, the lungs compliance, meaning the, the more normal the compliance, how much pressure do you need in order to push air into a very compliant lung? Do you need high or low pressure? What do you think? Is it hard or easy to ventilate a very compliant lung? I can hear you, Angelica. Put your mouth closer to the microphone. Is it low pressure? Lower pressure, very good. How much volume can you put in there? High or low volume in a very compliant lung? High. High, High volume. Now let's change it. If the compliance drops, let's say the patient now developed respiratory failure, ARDS, COVID-19, whatever. Now, how much pressure do you need in order to ventilate 
a very non-compliant lung. A lot, a lot. Or a lot of pressure. However, how much volume can you put in there? It's low, very low. if it's very non-compliant. Low, low. Less pressure. So this is the principle we use in mechanical ventilation. This is not our problem. This is the doctor's problem. However, you're the one at the bedside, so technically it is still your problem. Uh, what I'm saying is um, the doctor decides how much pressure and how much volume to put in there. All right, it's all about the lung compliance and lung resistance. Are you with me so far? All right, let's go now to settings and then we'll go to the mode next. So we're, this is pretty much a, an artificial method of ventilating the patient. So how the doctor decides on what mode is depending on the work of breathing. So when we're breathing spontaneously, no problem. We are in charge of the work of breathing. In fact, we, have, we don't exert any effort. There's really no work. Uh, to speak of because it's all passive. Um, the, vent, the, the diaphragm does most of the job. It's only when we are exerting that we, we become conscious about breathing or when we are uh, experiencing a, a severe emotional event. So yeah, those are exceptions. But generally, no, uh, breathing is totally passive and we are even unconscious about it but this is now a artificial ventilator so the lung uh, our own spontaneous breaths are ineffective so we need help first is FiO2 we are breathing 21 percent oxygen at room air in a mechanical ventilator although we can start at 21 percent it may be necessary to increase it because now we are forcefully putting air into the patient's lung so although, again, we can start at 21, usually we'll start around 24, maybe 28%, and then we'll go from there. So the doctor decides how much FiO2 to give the patient. Next is the rate. So we breathe normally 12 to 20 times a minute. However, most patients who are ventilated can breathe spontaneously. The only exception is in the OR when we are um, giving the patient general anesthesia. So the patient is paralyzed with succinylcholine. So therefore, paralysis means paralysis. Like even the diaphragm cannot move. So therefore, the patient has to be intubated and then the, the ventilator is in charge with 100% work of breathing. Um, not so in all other patients. We did not paralyze the patient. So these patients do breathe, not effectively though, and their respiratory rate is slower. So therefore, we need to augment that. The usual setting on a vent is between 8 to 12. It can go higher, uh, but usually it's anywhere between 8 and 12. So this is how many, how frequent, you know, this a frequency of uh, per minute, how many breaths does the ventilator give the patient? So this is again a setting uh, ordered by the doctor. So uh, again, only 8 to 12 because you have to add the patient's spontaneous breaths there. I'll explain later uh, when we get to the mode. Uh, tidal volume. The so on the vent, uh, by the way, the rate on the ventilator screen may be R or it may be F, uh, which is frequency. Okay, so either R or F. Tidal volume, the symbol is V and small letter T. It's not really B, uh, both caps. Okay, so it's V and then um, small letter T. Well, it's still this T, but smaller here. Okay, that's how it appears on the screen. So most um, hospitals, like I said, base it on weight. So it's um, 
some will go six to eight. This one, this textbook says eight to 10. Regardless, it's around eight mils per kilogram. Uh, these are the consequences. So of course, the more air you put in there for each breath, then that will, uh, barrel means pressure. So there could be too high of a pressure. So remember earlier, does the lung compliance stay the same the whole time? Is there a guarantee that the patient will get better during mechanical ventilation? No, right? The no, patient no. can go bad. The lung can go stiffer. Therefore, compliance can drop. So does our tidal volume remain the same throughout the therapy? No, no. No. Tidal volumes must change with the uh, changes in the patient's lung compliance. Uh, here, lower BTs may be ordered on patients with ARDS or uh, um, um, lung injury uh, because, of course, they're stiffer. So we can't put, remember what you said earlier, C equals P over V, right? So always remember that. So that's how we decide how much pressure and how much tidal volume. It's really di uh, dictated by the compliance of the lung because we don't want to rupture that lung. And PEEP. PEEP is a setting on the vent. This is designed to prevent alveolar collapse. Uh, the setting is anywhere between three to five centimeters of water pressure. So what is PEEP? Uh, let me demonstrate. Okay, so let's say this is zero pressure. Okay, this line is zero pressure. So when we take a breath or the ventilator uh, delivers a breath, it goes psh, and then like this. So instead of going to zero, because normal breathing, if we were normally breathing, if that's zero pressure and we we're breathing and we're measuring it, it goes negative first because we are negative pressure ventilators. So it goes below zero and it goes up. Psh, <sighs> okay, so that's our normal breath. We go to zero pressure at the end of inhalation, uh, exhalation. So next breath again. So this is Gio's breath. <sighs> All right, so that's a normal uh, ventilation. In a mechanical ventilator, can, since they are positive pressure, so the graph would be above zero. It will no, never go uh, negative because it's a positive pressure ventilator. So the the breath go breath is delivered and then goes down. Instead of going to zero like here, this one will go because you put it at three to five centimeters. So it will stay at three to five centimeters, meaning there's a pressure constantly being blown by the ventilator. It's not a breath. It's just a pressure being. Uh, this is the breath. So the, the, the vent pushes air in there, pushes the tidal volume in. And then as it stops pushing, so the air is expelled passively. Remember, exhalation is passive. Uh, however, because of the pressure exerted by the PEEP, it doesn't allow the pressure to go zero. So the pressure remains between three or five centimeters of water pressure. So by so doing, the lungs, do they empty completely? Do the alveoli completely empty? No, they no, don't. No, they stay partially inflated, depending on the how much peep the doctor orders. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. All right, so let's go. So that is peep. The purpose of PEEP again is that's one to prevent alveoli from collapsing. Another purpose is instead of increasing FiO2, why not increase PEEP? All right. So the 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 um, the, uh, the advantage of adding PEEP is you don't have to uh, administer high FiO2 because uh, you know oxygen can cause toxicity. So. Instead of increasing the FiO2, you can just increase the PEEP, 
right? So you can uh, give um, a little peep, a little a little push. That way, you know, you you improve uh, gas exchange without using high FiO2. Okay, modes now. Uh, I described the controlled mode earlier with the OR. This is only possible in a paralyzed patient because in the control uh, mode, the the machine is is in charge. The ventilator decides when the patient gets a breath because remember we have an airway. So if the patient wants to breathe, can they breathe? No spontaneous breaths are possible here. Here. If the patient tries to breathe spontaneously in this mode, the patient's workload to breathe may be increased because the the ventilator only delivers the breath at the preset ra uh, rate and at the preset tidal volume, meaning the patient cannot possibly take a breath because the, the ventilator won't allow them. The ventilator won't give them a breath. Remember, the patient is connected to the circuit to the ventilator. So therefore, in order to accomplish controlled mode, the patient must be paralyzed because it's just impossible here. If the patient attempts a breath, the breath will not be supported at all. Patient can't get a breath. It's impossible. So only, so this is be, um, uh, this is um, um, really uncomfortable. Patient has no control. Imagine being in that scenario. Who wants to, be, to have absolutely no control? Um, Giselle. How do you feel with when you have no control over anything? How do I feel? How do I feel? <laughs> yeah. You go crazy, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, controlled again. This is only used in the OR on a patient receiving um, general anesthesia. All right. Almost everybody starts at this mode, assist control. So the patients uh, obviously are in respiratory failure, uh, heart failure, uh, chest trauma, etc. So their breathing, however, it's not effective. They can't support life with their breathing. The spontaneous breath are ineffective. They can't meet oxygenation needs. Or in ARDS, for instance, you know, um, gas exchange is impossible then. So uh, as we have assist control, so the, the ventilator will assist the patient while maintaining a certain extent of control. So it's a volume mode. So this mode will have a preset rate, meaning it will have a, um, a minimum amount of breaths which will be delivered per minute. Let's say, uh, as stated earlier, between eight and 12. So let's say it's 12, okay? So the frequency is 12, and it also has a preset tidal volume. Uh, let's say for each breath, it will deliver, I don't know, uh, 400 ml, okay? Uh, 400 ml with each breath 12 times a minute. Regardless if the patient breathes or not, the patient will get 12 breaths at 400 ml per breath, whether or not the patient breathes. However, can the patient breathe? Yes, they can. The only thing is when the patient attempts a breath, they cannot determine the tidal volume because in this mode, if the patient attempts a breath, they will be given the preset volume. So the only thing the patient can control is the rate. They can breathe faster than the preset rate, but they can never breathe lower than the preset rate they can only control, they, meaning they can only control the rate by adding to it. They can never breathe less than the preset rate because regardless, again, the machine is set to deliver 12 breaths, let's say, per minute and 400 ml for each breath. The patient can increase that. They can breathe faster than the preset rate. They can add maybe four or maybe they can add their own 12. They can add 12 on top of it. Um, however, remember that 
whenever they initiate a breath, they will get the preset volume. Are you with me so far? Yes. Yes. Okay. So they can they can control the rate of breaths, meaning they can add to it, but they can never control the volume. The volume. Yeah. So they can't decide, oh, I, I need only maybe 200. Okay, I just need 200 ml. They can't do that. The vent is um, programmed to deliver 400. You'll get 400. Okay, you breathe, take it or leave it. In fact, the patient can't leave it. The patient has to take it. If they initiate the breath, they will get 400, whether they like it or not. Of course, that will lead to this disadvantage. The patient can go into respiratory alkalosis because the more breaths they, the more spontaneous breaths they take. And remember, that adds to the preset rate. So on top of the 12, if they take 12 more of their own, then of course that would be 24. So their minute ventilation is now 24 times 400. I don't know what that is. 24 because it's 24 total breaths times 400 ml. Their minute ventilation is now 9,600 ml. Right, and of course, respiratory alkalosis will cause these problems right here. Okay, so it can get uncomfortable. If the patient gets better on this mode, um, it will be extremely uncomfortable. So if the nurse uh, during ABG uh, assessment, you know, nurse draws ABG. How come a patient uncom looks uncomfortable? They, they, you know, they get restless. So they draw ABG. Is this an oxygenation problem? If the PaO2 is good, no, it's not that. So if the patient shows respiratory alkalosis, oh, that means the patient is breathing faster. So is this mode still appropriate for that patient who is obviously getting better? Do we continue with assist control? No. 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 Now we switch to the um, SIMV. We will skip the uh, intermittent mandatory because really this is uh, similar to uh, assist control. Uh, assist control is also known as um, CIMV or continuous intermittent mandatory ventilation. So let's go to SIMV. SIMV is uh, a better patient. In fact, it can be used as a weaning mode. It can be used to wean patient only, or it can also be used to uh, as a main ventilatory mode. No, not necessarily weaning the patient, but the patient is getting better. So we can put them on SIMV, just like the patient we had earlier who was already in respiratory alkalosis. So here, we can um, drop the rate uh, because obviously the patient was breathing more, so we don't need 12 here. So we can do with, you know, less than 12. We can do 8 or maybe 10, uh, depending on the patient. So here, if the patient does not initiate a breath, meaning they don't breathe, no problem. There's This is still a volume mode. SIMV has a preset rate, has a preset volume. Although the rate is considerably a little bit lower than assist control. Uh, not only that, when the patient does breathe, they can breathe at their own tidal volume. Again, let me repeat. If a patient doesn't take a breath, that's fine. There's a preset volume and a preset rate, okay? Um, but again, we didn't put the patient here unless they were getting better. Because if they were still bad, we will keep them in assist control. So the patient here in SIMV is better. However, they're not obviously not ready to be extubated yet. They still need the ventilator, but they're better than they were. No, they're in a better shape than uh, initially uh, when they were intubated. So here the patient's getting better, but the respiratory uh, rate or volume isn't very, uh, isn't compatible with life yet, meaning they can't be, they're not ready to be breathing on their own. So we're just giving them a little bit of uh, assistance. So here there's still a preset rate, which is again lower than in, in AC. Uh, there's still a preset volume, 
However, the difference is when, remember in assist control, when the patient initiates a breath, the vent delivers the preset volume, correct? Here, if a patient breathes spontaneously, they'll be left alone. The ventilator will not give the preset volume. It will allow the patient, well, knock yourself out. Okay, you want 200, fine. You want 600, fine, whatever you want. Okay, so the patient here determines their own tidal volume, which is now better because now the patient can decide whether to breathe less or breathe more. So here there will be no respiratory alkalosis. There's no hyperventilation. Patient feels more comfortable at this mode. Again, this, um, this of course is uh, pres presuming the patient is getting better. All right. So, and this mode, um, by the way, I forgot to mention, which is not mentioned here in uh, assess control. This, this here can also uh, result in breath stacking, you know, a, a breath on top of a breath. Because um, imagine if the preset rate is 12, that means per minute, the patient will get a breath pretty much every five seconds, correct? Yeah? If it's 12, yes or no, 60 divided by 12, that's five, right? So that means every five seconds, the patient will get a breath. Now imagine if the patient initiates a breath between ventilator delivered breath at the wrong time. So let's say um, one and a half seconds before the scheduled ventilator breath, the patient decides to take a breath right there. So that means, remember, a breath takes one second. So therefore, if the patient gets a breath at around three and a half seconds, that means the breath stops at 4.5. So will the patient have enough time to exhale before the next breath is given? No, no. No. So that means halfway uh, between, um, halfway into the exhalation, the patient now gets another breath. So therefore, imagine yourself doing this. So let me uh, simulate. <laughs> so I, I get another breath before I could completely empty my lung. Okay, that is extremely uncomfortable. So here in wow. SIMV, the patient, the, the ventilator doesn't do that. It uh, synchronizes because the, a ventilator is a computer, right? So it will uh, synchronize uh, the patient with the patient's breathing, meaning it will analyze how is this patient breathing. So if there's, uh, so it analyzes the pattern. So therefore, if it's too close for the next breath, it will not give the breath too close to the patient's breath, making it completely comfortable um, and and synchronized with the patient's breathing effort. Okay, very comfortable. So again, ideal for weaning. Uh, this can be a main ventilatory mode or it can also use strictly for weaning. When weaning though, we can drop the breaths all the way down to two if used for weaning. Because of course, you, you're getting ready to extubate the patient, then you don't need to give breaths. So maybe uh, sometimes even one, okay, the patient, the, the vent will only give one breath or maybe two uh, per minute and that's it. Um, the, the, the vent is capable of two modes. You can also add pressure support there. Um, pressure support is another mode, which is a pressure mode. Um, pressure support that has no preset rate, no preset volume. Therefore, pretty much the, the vent doesn't give a breath at all in pressure support. It just gives pressure. The only thing preset here is pressure. So, um, obviously used for weaning because the patient has to be breathing in order to be put on pressure support because imagine the vent not giving any breaths, no tidal volume, no rate. So that means the vent is simply giving pressure support with each breath, kind of like a CPAP. So that's uh, pressure support. Um, we won't um, discuss this one because uh, that's not very common. So here, so we're only testing uh, control 
AC, SIMB, and PSB. Uh, pressure support I already described. So this is a pressure mode. Um, no preset rate, no preset tidal volume, only a preset pressure. That's it. So therefore, only pressure, no breaths given. Um, used only as a weaning mode. Won't help a sick patient. A sick patient can't be on PSV. All right, let's wrap this up. Let's go to complications. One uh, complication was mentioned earlier, viral trauma. So which is uh, pressure trauma. It can potentially rupture the lung. Um, the most serious is ventilator associated pneumonia. We have others like hypotension. Hypotension is due to, remember PEEP earlier, wherein the lung doesn't um, completely empty because you have uh, positive and expiratory pressure. Remember that part? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if the PEEP is high, uh, that means the intrathoracic pressure will increase and therefore it will squeeze the heart longer than usual so therefore the superior and the inferior vena cava will be compressed extra long um, so venous return drops cardiac output drops so that's the cause of the hypotension uh, infection we're talking about pneumonia here of, of, uh, obviously and we have barotrauma aspiration can lead to ARDS and we will make the lung stiffer um, but again the most serious here is uh, pneumonia There are two alarms and it's really easy uh, if you read uh, the causes. It's anything that will obstruct either the circuit or the um, ET tube. So let's say you have a mucus there, patient bites it, patient has a pneumothorax. So all of these cause increased resistance between the patient and the ventilator, meaning the ventilator has a hard time pushing the tidal volume in. When it attempts to, to um, deliver a breath, there's increased pressure. You know? So of course the machine will um, yell, you know, high pressure, high pressure. Um, what's the sound? It's a, it's, it's four tones. Um, I can't imitate the tone. I think it's I think that's the high pressure alarm. Uh, and then low pressure alarm, it's the opposite. No resistance. So here there's high resistance caused by these. Here there is no resistance. Okay, no pressure, no challenge. So the it will also trigger an alarm. Because um, or it you can add one here if the patient extubated themselves. So if the patient pulled the um, ET tube out, of course, there will be no more resistance, right? Um, so question on exam will be either I'll let you identify what are the causes or I'll let you identify. So what would you do? So these are the actions for for each problem. So these are the causes. This is what you do to address that problem. Same thing for low pressure. Um, uh, here's a safety alert, please read. Just like in um, cardiac monitor, you know, card telemetry in dysrhythmias, do we check the monitor first or the patient? Monitor first or patient? Patient, patient. Patient. All right, always look at the patient first, regardless of what the ventilator says. And if you cannot identify a problem, let's say there's an alarm going off. You tried your best to fix it. You can't fix it. As a result, the vent stopped delivering a breath. So disconnect the patient from the vent and use the bag valve mask to ventilate the patient until you fix the problem. If you can't fix it, then ask them to give you another vent. Uh, please read the, um, these are the uh, complications mentioned up here. So they discuss here the cause 
and then the uh, interventions. So cost interventions, this, um, this one, same thing, cost, do the intervention, do the same for each one. Now for ventilator associated pneumonia, mm -hmm. there is a bundle for this one. Uh, this is specific. Here is the, where is the bundle? Right here. Uh, prevention, this is the bundle. Um, head of the bed elevation, 30 to 45. Um, suction the subglottal area. Um, no routine changes, which I mentioned earlier, no routine changes of the circuit. Um, that's not complete though, there's more. Right here, these are the others. Um, peptic ulcer prophylaxis. This is also part of the bundle. Uh, you may say, why? Well, if you put, um, if you give them a PPI, because this is a PPI or H2 receptor blocker, if you keep the secretions down, meaning what will happen to your gastric pH? If you give H2 receptor blockers or PPI, what will happen to your gastric pH? Does it go uh, higher? Okay, it will go higher. So in case the patient aspirates, will it cause ARDS? Will yes. it cause acute lung injury? No, I mean with, with a higher pH. No. No. Okay, so that's why it's part of the um, VAP bundle. Make sense? Yes, yes. All right, so this is part of the VAP bundle. Of course, uh, this one, daily oral care with chlorhexidine, that's part of your two hour, that's every two hour mouth care. Uh, it comes in a kit, you don't have to get it separately. So they, they make things easy for you. So there's no reason for you not to do oral care. Uh, so these are all part of your bundle, all right? Uh, this is part of the sedation. Of course, the, the sooner you take the patient off the vent, the, then that's part of the prevention of pneumonia, actually. Uh, professor? I'm yes. Sorry to interrupt, uh, but we're supposed to be going to our uh, the next class Zoom because we have an exam. All right, I'm done. Um, uh, so here's the summary of your VAP bundle, and that's it. I'm not testing weaning. I'm not, you know, the procedure. Um, that's that's fine. I don't have questions on that. Any questions before we go?